Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the Gastro Girl Podcast. This episode is brought to you with support from Ironwood. And as always, friends, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and write a review for the podcast and the podcast episodes. Thank you so much. We're so excited to have an amazing patient and patient advocate, Lori Plung. She's an IBD patient and she's also living with short bowel syndrome. And uh, we have a lot to learn from her and be inspired by. So welcome, Lori. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. I, it's so fun when we are engaged on social media and then we finally kind of virtually meet um, here. So it's always great. So thank you. Um, so for those of us who may not know, including myself, I don't know much about short bowel syndrome. Can you just give us from your patient perspective, if I was, you know, I'm your girlfriend, you know, a good friend, like what would you tell me what it is? Yeah. So short bowel syndrome is just a, another illness, right? It's not easy to live with. It means that I don't have personally, everybody has short bowel syndrome in a different way. Personally, I don't have enough small intestine to absorb the nutrients that I need to live every day. So when I eat, I am not taking in the nutrients for me to, you know, to, to function. When you eat, you take in all the nutrients you need for your body to do its everyday thing. So for me, and for many of us with short bowel, we are supplemented with different ways to receive our nutrition. Well, thank you for that. That sounds hugely challenging. Um, so why I, first of all, I appreciate your coming on and sharing your story. I know it's not always easy, but it, if we can help one person, you know, understand uh, what it is and inspire them to live the best they can, then we've done hopefully a good job together today. Um, and I know you've done a lot uh, with your work already. Um, so let's start with your personal journey, like with short bowel syndrome. How and um, when were you diagnosed? Like what, what, were the, what was the pathway to your diagnosis? Sure. So my journey started with being diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was 16 years old, a really long time ago, and um, pretty mild disease at the time. There were not a lot of medications out there. So as my disease progressed, I, I, my bowel was just destroyed. It was requiring a lot of surgeries. I was getting stricturing disease. And as a Crohn's patient, you have this mindset that when you have surgery, you want to maintain as much bowel as possible. So with each surgery, which I did require surgeries because I was because my intestines were not functioning and were not um, were inflamed. I would make sure to pick my surgeon wisely so that I knew that this surgeon would be conservative, right? Because as an IBD patient, we are, it's, it's put into our brain, you don't want to end up with sharp bowel syndrome, right? And that's what eventually ended up happening. I've had six major surgeries. Wow. After my fifth surgery, I tipped over to sharp bowel. And through the whole process, with each surgery, you know, the surgeon would say, oh, you border on short gut, you border on short gut. Well, what did that really mean? I, I, didn't, I really didn't have a grasp of that. I just knew it wasn't good, right? So, and then eventually after my fifth surgery, I tipped over and, um, and it was a whole new world. So that means you don't have the small intestine, the part of the colon that is this what would be considered the small intestine so you're missing that and a, with every surgery they would take a little more a little more a little oh, more until right. you don't have that one that part exactly of so wow. our intestines right we have a colon which is the large bowel and then we have the small bowel right which is from you know right past the stomach all the way to the colon, right? So that's our small intestine. That's where all absorption of nutrients take place. So with each surgery, there was resections little bit by little bit by little bit until I ended up with just 69 centimeters of bowel left. That's all I have left. 
and I have no colon. My colon was taken out of my first surgery along with my terminal ileum. So that, you know, pretty much set me up right from the beginning to have problems because having an ileostomy, um, a permanent ileostomy, sets you up for its own challenges of dehydration. Um, however, if you have an ileostomy and enough small bowel, then you're absorbing with no problem. But I ended up with short gut. Wow. I mean, I'm speechless. I can't imagine living. I mean, I, you know, we take it for granted when we don't have those those challenges or those health challenges. But um, let me ask you this. What were the initial symptoms that led you to first seek medical care? Like, how do you know? Like, you, you're, you're, how do you know what's happening in your body? Yeah, so that's a really, really good question, Jackie. I think what ends up happening for many patients is they don't know they have short bowel syndrome, right? So they develop symptoms of diarrhea and pain and and um, not feeling well, and their nutrients are out of whack, and they're you know, they're just not well. For me, I want to consider myself one of the lucky ones because after my fifth surgery, the surgeon knew I had short bowel syndrome. So as I was recovering in the hospital, that team started educating me on it. And I was able to have a little bit of knowledge before I left the hospital and have a diagnosis of short bowel syndrome, right? Um, not that that was easy, right? I'm talking about it like it was a walk in the park. It wasn't. It was very difficult to all of a sudden be told you can't do this and you must do that and you'll, you know, you'll have a Hickman in your chest for the rest of your life and be on, you know, nutrients through your vein and supplemental hydration through an IV. So these were all things that, um, that were really hard to, to grasp. But with that being said, I do feel fortunate that I didn't have to experience the symptoms and say what's going on. Because remember, I straddled two diseases, right? Short bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease. So with Crohn's, you know, you have an off day and you have diarrhea and you're not feeling well, you blame it on the Crohn's. So if I wasn't told, how would I know what's what, right? Wow. Yeah. So, and you know, we're not trying to scare people or alarm people, but we do want to give truth. We want to, you know, I think you're a great testament to, you know, I'm sure your journey was not easy by any means, but we also want to give people hope to know that you can get through it like you have. And and that's what we're here for to understand. So what, you know, once you have been diagnosed with short bowel syndrome, what happens? Like what how has it impacted your life? Like in the beginning, when you first came home from the hospital, like how does life change for you? Yeah. So for me, it was all about my TPN, which is total peripheral nutrition, right? As I said before, I have a Hickman catheter in my chest, which is just like a really big IV, just like we get in our arms, really big IV, which can handle the amount of fluid and nutrients that my body requires. So it was all about the TPN, right? Um, now, I was not new to TPN. I've had it in the past to, for before and after each surgery. I've always been built up with TPN, and then I would wean off, wean off TPN after surgery. This time, I wasn't weaning off. So that was really hard for me to wrap my head around. So that's one thing. The next thing was um, my diet, right? What can I eat? What do I have to stay away from? Now I learn that I cannot hydrate myself, right? Somebody's thirsty, you grab a bottle of water, right, and you're done, right? That doesn't work for people with short bowel syndrome because as it was explained to me that the water coming through is like a slip and slide, right? There's oh, nothing for it to grasp onto in the small uh. bowel to be hydrated, right? Now- as your journey goes on, what I've learned from my medical team is that your small bowel does adapt to, you know, a bit, right? So maybe I absorbed a little bit of the water, but truly I can't, I cannot do it myself. But what I 
did learn and what I can do and what many patients do do is that we drink oral rehydration solutions, right? So an ORS. So there's little container, little um, packages of things that you can buy uh, that are ORS. So I drink drip drop. There's other things on the market. And, you know, just put the, the, the package into your water, you shake it up and it comes in all sorts of flavors and you just sip on that. And that's a way for your body to grab your small intestine to grab what it needs to, to hydrate instead of the slip and slide phenomenon. Um, that was news to me. I had no idea. Right. So it really was acclimating to to learning what I can eat, what I could tolerate that wasn't gonna just come straight through me and cause diarrhea, right? Um, learning how to to be on TPN um, more on a permanent basis. Um, having a home health nurse come once a week to um, change my dressing and take blood work, you know. All of these things, it was it was a new world. And with that being said, I have a great quality of life, all because I do all of that, right? And that's what it's about. I mean, that's amazing. I'm trying not to get all choked up just imagining what you had to go through because, you know, we take it for granted that we can, you know, go and get a slice of pizza or, you know, drink, you know, a pop or something. And, you know, we, we don't think of food as it's what it really is, which is a, a source of nourishment and sustaining life. It's not just, you know, oh, we're going to eat because we like this peanut butter cookie or something. It's like you, you're, you know, you're making me think, oh my God, like this, it's not just about eating, it's about sustaining your life. And and that's just um, unbelievable. Like I don't even have words. Um so, I mean, you had to relearn what food means to you, right? You had to learn and and really be mindful. You know, we talk about mindful eating, but this is a whole new level because you have to get sustenance or else. Right, right. So, so for me, it was learning about what was going to come through me and cause more of a problem. I knew I was being nourished because I was getting it through my TPN, right? That's total peripheral nutrition. So my doctor was putting all the micro and macronutrients into my TPN to sustain me, right? Um, The goal, the goal was, and still is, to wean off, wean down from that caloric wise as my sixty nine centimeters of bowel starts to learn how to readjust and absorb in whatever way it's going to absorb. So it's funny you mentioned pizza. My doctor likes to say to me, okay, the only amount of calories really in your TPN right now are equivalent to maybe two slices of pizza, right? Pizza, and that, that's always my go-to, believe it or not. Love pizza. And I can tolerate it, which is so funny. So that's not a lot of calories, right? So I do have to eat. And I love to eat. Right? So you can eat You can eat things. I but- can eat. Okay. I just have to be careful with what I eat. So can I drink a whole glass of milk? No. There's lactose, right? The oses and the aces can be hard for many of us to digest, even without bowel problems, right? right, right? So I can't drink a whole glass of milk, but I can put some almond milk into a smoothie, right? It's about readjusting. And what's really helpful is to be with a GI-focused dietitian. Right. They are a wealth of information for anybody with with any type of GI issues, right? And remember, I'm coming in through the IBD world, right? Through my Crohn's lens and adding the SBS lens on top of it. So um, you know, I can eat cheese, I can't eat soft cheeses, cottage cheese. Is, is difficult. Any of the soft cheeses go through me too quickly, but our hard cheese, I do well with. So it's just kind of experimenting. It's learning. There's pretty much a rule of thumb, you know, sugar, you know, cookies and candy. But guess what? I love cookies and candy and I am not giving it up, right? So will I sit and eat a whole bag of M&Ms? No. Will I have a handful? Absolutely, right? The whole point is a quality of life. What is your quality of life? 
And the TPN is there and you always know that you're getting the nutrients you need. Is that How does that work like when you have that? Do you have to go um, for regular doctor's appointments? Do they measure? Do they take blood and see what your levels are? Like how, how does that – what does that look like for, for a patient yeah. like you? So every week I get a shipment of my TPN. It comes in a big box. It comes from my specialty infusion pharmacy and they're amazing. And it has to stay in the refrigerator. And I hook in for eight hours at night. I do it overnight. Some patients do it during the day, but I do it while I'm sleeping. And um, and to know what goes in there, it's all about my doctor. He's he's my right hand man. He's the best, and and the team. So they take the blood work, um, and based on my blood work, and they uh, they know what what to what to move around in there, what to add more of, what to take out. And then I meet with him every three months. We have an appointment and he looks for certain markers, right? Am I sustaining my weight? Am I, is my blood pressure up? If your blood pressure up is up for me, it can mean that I have too much fluid in my body. So then we can pull back a little, oh, okay. right? Right now I... I'm on a liter, a liter of TPN, right? Just like when you think in the hospital, a liter of fluids, right? Um, But I started on two liters when I came home, a real big bag, right? Oh, wow. Um, So I was able to taper down. And it really is all around, you know, my life really kind of is surrounded by my TPN. When do I take it out of the refrigerator to warm it up before I plug in? What time do I plug in? Um, how do I plug in, right? I had to learn all of this. Now I can do it in my sleep. It's just second nature to me. Really overwhelming at the beginning. And I remember the nurse coming the first day and saying, you know, helping me plug in. And and I just cried. I'm like, I'll never learn to do this. She said, I promise you will. And now I'm helping other people, you know, when they have a question because it's it's easy. There's a pump, it goes in a backpack, it lays by my bed. It's not ideal, you know. Would I like to just at night if I'm tired, just get into bed and go to sleep? Yeah. But do I have to do this? Yeah. And it's and it's okay, right? Just giving me a quality of life. Oh, that's very interesting. Oh my goodness. So when you get your specialized pack packages from your doctor, do all short bowel syndrome patients get the same kind of treatment or what do you have an idea of what the treatment looks like? Do you have choices or what does that look like? Are there options? Yeah. So for everybody, it's different, right? I think some people with short bowel might do tube feedings. Um, it just, everybody's different. And it, 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 you know, not everybody, everybody comes to their short bowel in a different way, right? They, some people are born with short bowel, right? So they don't know any different. This is how, has been their life from the time they've been a baby. Some people have a traumatic accident and need surgery and end up with short bowel. So it just depends on your personal journey and what you and your team decide is best for you. You know, the goal is how are you going to get your nutrition if you cannot absorb it on your own? And some people can absorb, right? Some people can. They can absorb more than others um, and do not need TPN support. So it just, everybody's different. So is there any other medications that you have to take for the short bowel syndrome or is it or is it the just the this the nutrition support that you have? Um yeah, so so I I did so there are some medications on the market which were so so lucky that um you take subcutaneously, you know, through a shot that you give yourself and it helps the um it helps the the bowel to in Increase to absorb, right? Um, and it's really very medical, and and I am sure um, that you'll be covering that later on, right? But I did try this medicine because it's really effective for a lot of people. For me, it wasn't effective, and the reason it wasn't was because um, it, one of the side effects is 
causing strictures, right? So the bowel comes too close together, food can't come through. And as a Crohn's patient, strictures, you know, I'm very familiar with them and who wants to go through that, right? So it defeats the whole purpose. So so it didn't work for me, but it works for a lot of people and it allows them to come off their nutrition support, right? And there's other, you know, there's anti-diarrheals. I don't take any of those. Um, you know, I, I'm on such a regimen of medications between the IBD that it's really more IBD focused yeah. and then whatever kind of overlaps I get the benefit of. Um, but, you know, it's also about knowing what to eat to slow your gut down, right? So I talked about the the sugars not being good for you and the soft cheeses and soda and all that. Um, however, if you eat like complex, I think it's complex carbohydrates, right? And this is where the registered dietitian comes in, like pastas and breads. And um, if you could tolerate, you know, whole grains and some fibers, that slows the gut down, right? So it keeps the food in you longer. And that, you know, I, I try to concentrate on that too, right? And don't forget, I have the ostomy. So I'm also, you know, dealing with you know, trying to keep my output not as watery because that can open up a whole nother can of worms, oh which my. is for a whole nother podcast. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, so a, another medication that's helpful for a lot of small bowel patients, which um, they really have to talk to their doctor, is bile acid binders, right? Because bile acid is just can cause diarrhea if it's not controlled properly. Really? And um, yeah, so oh, wow. that's one of one of my meds as well. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned um, the importance of your healthcare team, and I want to stress this because I think you know when you're a patient, you find out you have this condition. It can seem overwhelming, as you kind of alluded to early on. What role has your healthcare care team played in your journey, as well as you know the support of your family and friends in managing um, your condition? Yeah, such a great question. So, you know, when I speak to other patients, I say that you really want to cultivate a relationship with your healthcare team because they are, they're your people, right? They are going to help you to feel the best that you can. They're going to be to the go-to when you don't feel well, and they are going to manage your disease, right? And I like to think of it as, you know, having a chronic illness such as SBS or IBD as a team sport, right, with your healthcare team, um, you know, where the physician and the team, they're kind of the coaches and we're just a really big part of the team, right, because we have to let them know how we're doing and feeling. Um, it's a huge part of my um disease process, right? And management. Um, and I am never worried to reach out if I need help. Um, I am not worried to challenge them if I, you know, feel something is, you know, whatever it is, we have good conversations and I go in with a list of questions and they're my people, right? And it's really important to cultivate that. And it's also, I believe, really important having sharp bowel syndrome to seek out an intestinal rehabilitation group, right, um, who are familiar with um, SBS because not every doctor knows about it, right? And you want your best chance of having your best quality of life, and you need to go to a specialist for that. So there are great teams around the country, mostly at academic medical centers, um, and you, there's lists out there, and you could Google and and all of that. But um, super important. Um, as for the support of family and friends, I couldn't do it without them. Right, my husband is my number one. Um, I mean, my husband, my kids, my family, everybody. Um, but I will tell you, my husband sits with me at night when I plug in so we could get into bed together, unless I could see that he's falling off his face. I'm like, get into bed. I'll be there soon, you know, kind of thing. Um, <laughs> he, I can't travel without him, right? And I travel. It's all wow. about quality of life, right? 
I have to take my TPI and keep it cold. We put it in a Yeti and off we go. And it's heavy, right? So he, he's carrying it for me. You know, so yeah. this is, you know, talking about awesome. a team, right? Um, a team sport in a different way. Um, so, so having just having the validation on the days you just don't feel great, right? Um, is really important too, right? Um, and, and, being able to bring your family with you to a doctor's appointment can be really overwhelming, especially at the beginning. So um, to, to lean on your, your family and, and friends. Um, and I'm also lucky to have a great group of friends who understand as well. Well, I'm going to sound really cheesy in the shadows of the Olympics and you're talking about team and you certainly get a gold medal <laughs> Lori, for your amazing uh, positive attitude and, you know, sharing your experiences so candidly with us. Um, truly, like, I'm so impressed with uh, all that you've been through and all what you're doing. Um, and before we get into that, you know, your advocacy work, I wanted to just ask you, what advice would you give someone uh, and their family uh, who has just been diagnosed with um, SBS? Like what advice would you give? Yeah. Them? So the advice I would give is you could live a really productive, happy life. This is just another illness just to manage to make sure you find the right team to help you manage it. It, it, it is not, it's not going to keep you from, from living your best life. It's just something to manage, but definitely hooking in with a good team to help you navigate um, and, and to help um, make sure your body's getting the nutrients it needs and, and all of that is really important and to find that team. But again, my big takeaway with anything that I do with um, talking to patients is about a quality of life, right? Um, that's, that's the most important thing. So you could do anything that you want with SBS. So along that line, what has been the most surprising, um, thing that you've learned about yourself throughout this journey? Yeah. So, um, I think, I think that I want to say that the resilience that I have that kind of bubbled back up when I was diagnosed, um, you know, it kind of was a shot in the gut, pun intended, <laughs> um, when I ended up, you know, tipping over to SBS and I just didn't think I can do it, right? And change is hard, right? So when I had my ostomy 34 years ago, I didn't think I could do that either. And now it's just part of my life and I barely remember life without it. Right. Um, so that was change and I was resilient and I did okay. Um, and after for so many years fighting, trying not to end up having SBS, you know, I'm, I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm going to do this. You know, I seek support. I seek, um, uh, support, psychological support to learn the skills to be able to accept my new normal. And, um, and it really helped my resilience bubble to the top. So yeah. That's all. Wow. Um, you're just amazing. I am just so impressed with you. And I know you've done a lot of work for advocacy. Can you share a little bit about that? And also, along those lines with your advocacy and resources for patients. Yeah. There is a small bowel syndrome fact sheet that I was an author on. Ironwood Pharmaceuticals was instrumental in helping us put that together. It's me and others who have SBS and also in the professional world. So that's something, a great resource for those out there. And I'm very, very happy to talk to anybody at any time. And, you know, just just surround yourself with others that are going to lift you up and, and, and help you and make you feel good through your challenges. Thank you so much. You've been a wonderful um, inspiration and a guest. And I really wish you all the best. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com.
Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.